Pretty well, every f- every advertisement is for something really expensive. You yeah. expect that, but about every fifth one is for watches. Why do you need a fifty thousand dollar watch or a hundred thousand dollar watch? Is that the best thing we can do from the point of society and helping each other to wear a year's wages on your wrist? Hey guys, welcome back to Adventure Fit Radio. Today we have a very special show for you. Um, this is actually my first ever uh, solo interview. So I was uh, a little nervous before this one, actually, believe it or not. I don't really get nervous before shows too often anymore. Um, if the audio sounds different now in the intro, by the way, guys, I'm also it's also because I'm recording this on my phone um, as I'm driving around Australia or... Uh, up one side of Australia, one coast, the, the east coast, with Ziggy, my dog. Um, so I apologise for the um, different audio. Anyway, this show is with Dr. Carl. You guys uh, may know Dr. Carl from uh, 25 years of being Australia's leading science communicator. Uh, Dr. Carl Kruzanitsky, his, uh, his name is, which is a difficult one to pronounce. I actually rehearsed that before I um, recorded this show, recorded this intro. Anyway, guys, it's a bloody great show, and you're going to love it. Um, a really interesting sit down with the doctor, and uh, the doctor and the doctor, the two doctors. Um, I don't know if I actually brought up the fact that my nickname's the doctor. I probably should have. Uh, he didn't even call me Doctor Bill, which was weird because he refers to people as doctor all the time, and I actually am the doctor. But uh, he just refused to refer to me as it. Anyway, it's a great show. You guys are going to love it. Before we get to the show, uh, we just want to quickly. Let you guys know about our sponsors. So uh, our sponsors for this show, guys, are True Protein. So make sure you head to trueprotein.com.au. What you can find there is all the uh, proteins, all the performance supplements, all the health food supplements that True Protein supply. Health food supplements, for example, superfood powders, um, sleep and recovery powders, um, protein snacks such as like protein pancakes, um, mug cakes, um, all types of supplements for teas and coffees, all your essential oils like medium chain triglycerides, um, vital greens. They've got everything. That's um, that's only in the health foods kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, if you want performance-based stuff, they've got your creatines, your amino acids. They've even got vegan amino acids if you want plant-based anything and everything. Um, pre-workout, post-workout, all the good stuff. So we are, uh, we are very happy to be... Um, partnered with True Protein. If I had to pick, they uh, they actually um, um, approached us guys on, in this one. If I had to pick a protein supplier, a supplement supplier in Australia, I would 100% go straight to True Protein. So I'm so glad that we've been able to um, that we've been able to partner up and give you guys uh, a look at what they do and give you guys a mad discount too. So 10% off at www.trueprotein.com.au. Yo's, yo's, use the code ADVF and you'll get 10% off any and all True Protein products. Also, guys, we're brought to you by AdventureFit Travel. Make sure you head to www.adventurefittravel.com. Check out all the stuff we have going on. We've just released a ton of trips. So at the moment on the website, what we have for you is we have... Bali, Greece, Vietnam, South Africa, Iceland, Mexico, Everest Base Camp is back. I repeat, Everest Base Camp is back. Um, Thailand and Hawaii. Um, And we've got more trips that are rolling out very, very soon. But I've got big news. Guys, if you want to support the show, we are now on Patreon. So what Patreon is, basically, is Patreon is a platform for um, creators to get funded by their audience, by their by their followers, by their listeners, by their viewers, by their whatever. So, bloggers, podcasters, writers, um, gamers, YouTubers live on Patreon. We've started a Patreon page. Uh, it's an Adventure Fit Patreon page, so it encompasses Adventure Fit Radio. So everything that we do here on the podcast, it encompasses Adventure Fit Travel. So we want to make sure that we can always get um, some photo video crew on our trips. We want to be able to make more epic travel content as we go. We want to do documentary film style stuff. We want to be able to inspire you guys for, um, for, for your travel, for your life, and we want to be able to tell interesting stories on the podcast. So with your help, we'll be able to do that more and more and better and better. You can do as little of a pledge as $1 um, 
all the way up. That's one dollar per month. Sorry, so just so you know, one dollar per month. So you can uh, you can pledge one dollar per month, two dollars per month. I think you can pledge five, ten, and twenty five dollars per month. You get all kinds of little uh, little bonuses from us, little goodies if you um, if you pledge with us, and also you will um, you'll help us. Just keep this podcast growing, keep everything really, uh, really viable into the future and keep bringing you uh, better and better stuff. So head to www.patreon.com forward slash adventure fit and uh, you can support us there. Also, guys, www.adventurefittravel.com. Use the code radio for 10% off. Here's the show. Alrighty, welcome back to Adventure It Radio, guys. We are sitting here with the great Dr. Carl. Carl, oh, I'm not that great. I'm not that great. I'm just, I don't know. Anyway, go well, on. Well, we're sitting here with the, the slightly above average Dr. Carl. Would you be more happy with that, Carl? Um, my IQ is 110, which is just barely above average. So I'm in there with two-thirds of the population that fit between 85 and 115. So slightly above average, yes. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll accept that, yes. Well, well, we're sitting here with, uh, we're sitting here with Carl. We're yeah. sitting here with Carl. Yeah, right. Okay, we've got that. <laughs> that, that, that is established yeah 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 all right all right i'm off to a good start here um carl thanks for uh thanks for taking the time to sit down with us um firstly why don't you tell the listeners that uh, don't know who you are a little bit about yourself and what you do um i am a storyteller i tell stories about science and to help me do this there's a three-part process the first part of the process is that I've been lucky enough to have 28 years of education for free. Thank you very much, taxpayers of Australia, (laughs) uh, including 16 years at university. And then the second part of that education is I read my way through $10,000 worth of scientific literature every year, which is a pile about a metre thick every month. And so that way I make sure I'm up to date with the latest uh, information. But then finally, the third stage is most important, if you just read stuff, you've got all this crap floating around inside your head. It's just mm-hmm. running around in circles. Mm-hmm. You don't know what's going on. And what you need to do really is to lock it into something solid. You've got to turn it into a story. Mm-hmm. And so I write about three or four stories every week. And so I tell stories. And after you write three or four stories every week for a couple of decades, you begin to pick up a bit of knowledge. So therefore I do question and answer sessions on various radio stations around Australia and overseas and TV and books and I've written 43 books, currently (laughs) working on number 44. (laughs) Just uh, just a lazy uh, 40, 43 books over the course of the journey, mate. Is there Um, any reason why you've written... That many books? You going for the, the Guinness World Record? Oh, surely no, there's, there's no way I could do surely it. Surely you're getting close? No, no. Um, <laughs> I think it was Isaac Asimov who wrote about 800 books. Right. And oh, he's he got was you covered by quite a, quite a bit then. Brilliant science fiction writer I and, yeah, and mm-hmm. genuine scientist who also was sexually impotent, had three wives who <laughs> uh, loved him to pieces and refused to travel on aeroplanes. <laughs> Right there, you go. There you go. Uh, there you go, guys. There's definitely a little uh, Isaac Asimov uh, tidbit for you. So, Carl, uh, let me ask you this. Yeah. So, um, obviously, it, it started somewhere. So, um, science to young kids isn't always the most glamorous subject in school. So, mm-hmm. where did it all begin for you? How did this all come about all those years ago? Having a sense of curiosity. Mm-hmm. So, there are some people who don't have a sense of curiosity, and therefore they don't care and you could tell them the most amazing thing like that the atoms in trees mostly come out of the air that in fact trees are mostly made of air and they don't care uh, i always had a sense of curiosity and i've always tried to understand things and i remember mm-hmm. when i was a kid somebody gave me an astronomy book for a birthday present and i, I remember reading it and i just sucked in all that information and the adults then put me up on a chair and started saying well how many planets are there in the solar system nine what are their names this how many moons have they got and i, I, I just sort of sucked in this information i suddenly realized that there was this huge world outside of wollongong where I lived. Mm-hmm. There was the state of New South Wales, and on oh my heavens, there was Australia, which was even bigger. I never really appreciated it until I looked at the map, and then there was our planet, which was uh, with about 200 countries in it. And then going even further, there were other planets in our solar system i had no idea and then there were other solar systems and now we know that there's around 200 billion 300 billion planets in our galaxy the million way mm-hmm. milky way and probably about a thousand billion galaxies in the universe mm-hmm. and i had this sense of awe and wonder which has never left me like no matter how much we know there'll always be more that we don't know yeah i, I find it fascinating i think um a lot of people i think grow up with that sense of wonder and then as they as they grow up they kind of 
it it wears off, you know, and people get into that routine and they they lose their lust for learning and for for exciting new things. Uh, it certainly happened for me until. Oh, yeah, it happened with you. Well, I was fascinated by the Egyptians and ancient Egyptians oh, when I was younger. So rem- uh, I, in my case, the only reason that I can be a useful member of society is that the Egyptians invented transparent rock about four thousand years ago. Okay, and I'm wearing two bits of transparent rock on my face. We call it glass nowadays, <laughs> yeah. and so I I, I owe big to the ancient. Egyptians, big it up for them, man. Yeah, so in yeah. your case, yeah, yeah. So um, I was just, I was just fascinated by the pharaohs and uh, and their beliefs and how the pyramids were built, obviously. But definitely, like everybody else, I went through a period where I just didn't give up on learning and and being inquisitive and and asking questions until I watched Interstellar. Ah. And and I say, I say always when I I have these fascinating conversations on our show with people like yourself and and we've we've interviewed um, Grant Lewis down at um, down at University of Sydney as an astrophysicist um, corrupt cops child soldiers interesting stories and it all happened with interstellar and it was because of a guy named Fred who was from Sydney and mm-hmm. uh, and I just watched interstellar and my jaw was still on the floor after the after the credits had started rolling after the film had finished and um, and Fred walked in and he said Bill, uh, uh, what are you what are you doing? What have, what have you been up to? I said, Fred, I just watched Interstellar. That was incredible. And and Fred said to me, and this is what did it for me. He said, it's uh, it's incredible how grounded in reality that film is as well. <laughs> and I looked at Fred. I said, excuse me, Fred, what part of that film that I just watched was grounded in reality? And since then, everything for me has been exciting again. I was ah. yeah, it was funny. Really? So you like the bit that when they were stuck on this planet orbiting a black hole really closely their time was slowed down so much that when they came back in contact with the rest of civilization um everybody else was a lot older than they were yeah well i didn't really understand time dilation at all i had no idea how it worked and then so i started googling it that night as soon as i finished the the film and fred had explained a little bit to me i started googling it and trying to figure out um trying to figure out how it all worked and then and I definitely didn't figure out how it all worked. Oh, it's big. It takes time. And then uh, and then I stumbled across, uh, across the Russian cosmonaut who holds the world record for time travel in to the future. Ah, are, you, are you aware of that he story? Was, how long was he in, in orbit for? Uh, I'm not sure, but he might have been in orbit for like 12 months or something like that and he went into the future 0.000002 of a second. Because we all uh, aged more quickly than he did. Is that it? Well, I don't know how it works, Carl. Yeah, so this we, is your, this we, is your we, department. This we, is where you have to jump in, mate. Older, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. So time dilation is present in GPS. GPS yes. would not work without it. So there's two factors involved. In one case, the satellites are moving faster than we are, so their time slows down. But on the other hand, they're in a lower gravitational field than we are, so relative to us, their time goes faster. And you have to compensate for those two factors. And if we did not have that, GPS would go out of true by ballpark figure a kilometre a day. Yeah, so that's incredible. So we have to use time dilation on a Saturday night when slightly inebriated you want to <laughs> navigate your way to the local pizza bar to get yeah. your healthy filling of saturated fats and yeah. why is it when you're slightly inebriated you want to have saturated fats instead Su- of a fruit Su- salad Suvlaki Suvlaki bar for me I, I think uh, Carbon but not, yeah. but not um, so that's saturated fats but you're not going for fruit salad no, no, I, I refuse it's, it's refuse fruit salad. Uh, that is a mystery. I feel like um, I feel like something that's going to feel maybe warm and fuzzy in my in my belly would be better than, than a fruit salad later uh, on. Okay, so anyway, <laughs> Interstellar got you started on just, asking questions. Yeah, it just it just um, it just got me hooked on learning again, ah. if you know what I mean. And and it's a really it's a it's a fun place to be in where you're you're excited about the world again. Not that ah. I wasn't excited about life in general, but excited about learning uh, ah, to a degree. I've, I've um, made a point of going and um, giving talks at the worst schools I could find in Australia <laughs> yeah, right. and they were defined as worst by the ratio between how many kids entered high school and how many stayed there all the way through to the end mm-hmm. so I found the worst ones in Western Australia South Australia Victoria etc and I made a point also of talking to the primary schools that were hanging off those high schools and it was interesting because in primary schools, the kids ask questions like crazy. But in high school, nothing. Mm. Absolutely nothing. There was no pretending to be curious. They were too cool to ask questions. They knew everything. And if they didn't know it, it wasn't necessary to be known because they were cool. It was a funny attitude. 
Yeah, I feel um, I feel very similar to the way people live their life day to day. I feel like I see that a lot. I, I own mm-hmm. a travel company, Carl. Oh, um, so I this take is a people- plug for your travel company. This is the podcast of the travel company, so it's a it's oh. a it's a one hour long plug. We I didn't know that part of uh, part of what we do is we we have interesting conversations. One of our pillars is conversation and uh, an interesting conversation. So I take people all over the world. I've travelled extensively, and I feel like that. The the analogy would be those children are, are are real. That's their real persona. They don't have any cliques, any any friendship groups, any kind of personality that they've built that they have to uphold. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, when you meet people traveling, you feel I feel like you meet the real people. Uh-huh. That's those children. And then when you um when you come back to real life and you you, you walk around Sydney and, and Melbourne and all these cities, I feel like you get um I feel like you get a more guarded. You know, everybody's got their their personality that they believe in. Does that make sense? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, mm. yeah. At what age does this happen that people begin to get more guarded and stop having a sense of curiosity, do you reckon? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Maybe around the um, the time that boys start trying to um, trying to find girls and girls start trying to find boys, that might maybe have something to puberty, do with it. Puberty, around so. puberty. Maybe. Okay. I'm not sure. Ah. I'm not sure. Carl, let me ask you this, though. You mentioned earlier... Um, that uh, obviously one of your big roles is you're, you're a science communicator. You tell stories. I tell basically. stories. And, yep, uh, that's me. Yeah, yeah. So um, why don't you tell us about why that's important and why, you know, where your role is in society with this? Because science communicators, I mean, you're probably our, our go-to guy Australia-wide. We, we've got Neil deGrasse Tyson, Brian Cox, you know, handles the UK t- to a degree. Um, why is that so important that you guys are prevalent in the face of, you know, people in society? Well, firstly, it's nice entertainment. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, who knew that in that whales are a particular size? Because if they were smaller, they'd freeze to death, and if they were bigger, they'd starve to death. They're sort of stuck in a fairly narrow <laughs> range. Right. And so I discovered that after a few hours reading. <laughs> and so the world is full of information. So by important, do you mean economically important? Well, maybe... 70% of Australia's income comes from things based on science and technology, really? especially agriculture. But it's um, also part of the overall package. Like you need to know science, but you need to know psychology mm-hmm. and you need to know a bit of economics. Um, so, for example, I was just reading at the bottom of my bank card statement the other day and it said that if I paid back the bill of about, I think it was $6,000, but if I paid it back at the minimum interest rate, I would pay it back in 79 years having paid a total interest of $35,000. Mm-hmm. Well, people should know that. Mm. They should understand the power of compact compound interest. They should know, for example, that 1% of everybody has psychopathic tendencies and can't be trusted further than you could kick them. Mm-hmm. And so science is part of that package of essential information and you should know how to change a tire and light a fire. And yeah. yeah, it's just, it's not the important thing. It's just one of the many things. And I happen to be in this field of science, so I'm just doing that bit. But I'm not saying it's the only or the most important thing. It's just one of the, well, many things that a well-rounded person should know. And uh, as, as part of it, for many people today, uh, and I'm sure this is just a transition phase, their highest skill, their highest technical skill, is being able to recharge their electronic device. Mm. Can't change a tire. Yeah. Spanner, screwdriver, no yeah. idea. Yeah. They need an app for it. Well, that's what they think. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. No. But uh, surely, surely the use of science and and popularising it and getting kids, you know, the earlier they are interested in science, surely that's what drives us forward as a as a society, right? Surely. Science is what's going to take us forward? Um, there are many forces involved. Uh, going one way, uh, peace is a good thing. But on the other hand, it leads to um, vast financial inequalities. So with regard to peace, uh, number one, we're living in the most peaceful time right now in human history. Mm-hmm. If you read the book, The Better Angels of Our Nature by Stephen Pinker, mm-hmm. and also the book called Factfulness by Hans Throstling. And if you look at the big picture and the small picture, it all comes out. So with the big picture, for example, consider world wars and or big wars, and people say that the um, 
And people say that the Second World War was the most bloody war ever in history on a percentage basis, but if you compare it to what happened in 755 in the An Lushan Revolt in China, to put down that revolt, the Chinese emperor killed one in every six humans alive on Earth. Wow. One in every three people in China. Mm. Genghis Khan killed one in every nine people on mm-hmm. Earth. Mm-hmm. Second World War, one in every 44. So on a big scale, we're getting better. And on a small scale, we're also getting better when you look at murder, violence, slavery, judicial torture, etc., etc. It's bumpy. It goes mm-hmm. up and down. Uh, the Syrian war right now is a terrible thing. But if you look at the big picture, we're heading in the right direction. And then if you read the book by Hans Strossling, that says the same thing. So on one hand, that's kind of where our society is being driven forward because you said specifically what's driving our society. But on the other hand, the longer of peaceful times that you have in a society, the greater the disparity between the poor and the wealthy. Mm -hmm. So in 2010... To equal the wealth of the bottom three and a half billion poorest people on the planet, you needed 343 billionaires, which I don't know why, but is seven cubed. And then if you roll forward to 2017 to equal the wealth of the bottom half of the planet, it had dropped from 343 to eight. Wow. Which, as a coincidence, is only um, two cubed. Don't know why they're both cubes. And um, that and these eight people are all white and they're all male. And then the other side of the coin is that it gets leveled, it gets reset. And you can read about this in a book conveniently called The Great Leveller mm-hmm. by Schindler. And what resets it, this imbalance of wealth and poor, is the four horsemen of the apocalypse, which he defines as war and plague mm-hmm. and collapse of the state and revolution. And I think there has to be a better way that doesn't involve the death of millions of people to reset the society, but I don't know what that way is. And why do you think? Um, why do you think we are like this as as human beings, Carl? Why do you think that we're able to turn a blind eye to half of the world, turn a blind eye to what we do to to animals, turn a blind eye to what we do to the planet? Why do you think that humans have this amazing capability of being so brilliant and so um, able to able to think in a grand, the grand scheme of things, but we're also very happy to turn a blind eye to everything that we're doing wrong. What, where, why do we have that capability? Why can't we see? Well, evolution got to be another doesn't way? have to be perfect. Mm-hmm. Uh, good enough is good enough. Mm-hmm. So long as the human race keeps on going. And so, if you go back to what's fairly well considered human, you go back six hundred thousand years ago to Homo heidelbergensis, mm-hmm. who was a bit shorter with a smaller brain and almost certainly had language. And then 200,000 years ago or so, Homo sapiens. And for most of that time, we just had to survive. And for you to survive, if you have to do something bad to somebody else, that doesn't matter because you survive. And now we've got a different sort of society. It's, on one hand, it's been coming over the last couple of hundred thousand years. On the other hand, it's much more recent. So, for example, agriculture has been around for about... 16,000 years to 500 years, depending on where in the world you're looking. Mm -hmm. But then you've got other changes, and you mentioned being turning the blind eye. Um, Look at height. Height is a good indicator of health. Mm -hmm. So I used to be a medical doctor, so this sort of concerns me. Um, For about two centuries, the residents of the USA were the tallest humans on Earth, until about the Mm mid-1970s. And then they're crappy medical care system and other things kicked into action and they stopped doing that and actually we're now in a situation where in America the life expectancy for certain groups has dropped Mm -hmm. where if a woman gives birth in child if a woman gives birth her chance of dying has increased how is that uh, how is that that, possible in this day and age that one that's America yeah Uh, yeah. whereas so and in England um, the residents of the United Kingdom the poor began to reach the high we were shorter than at all by about 20 to 30 centimetres until the Second World War. And after the Second World War, there were so many deaths, simply because of the large numbers of people involved, Mm -hmm. and it involved so many people because it was a world war. So after the Second World War, they suddenly thought, we've got to start feeding the poor, and laws were changed and measures brought in. So suddenly, the poor started rocketing up in height and became Mm -hmm. as tall as the wealthy. 
edit point here. We'll have to so just make a little note to mm -hmm. write down where you are and what we're talking about. No worries. And then I'll just get us ready for our next thing, hitting the off button right now. So, Carl, let me ask you. Uh, let me ask you this: talking about obviously humans, why we are the way we are, how we got to where we, uh, you know, where we are now. Um, okay. So, and you mentioned all the other human. Races, races of uh, Homo, this, that, Homo and the other. Homo Heidelbergensis, who yep. had language from six hundred thousand years ago to a couple hundred thousand years ago. Yep. Okay, so um, let me ask you this: Did we just eradicate all of the other species of Homo, whatever that was going to potentially be where we're at now with language and and culture and society? Why? This is a commonly asked question, I believe, to people that don't know any better, and that's mm. why aren't you know chimps sitting down recording podcasts? shooting the shit like we are right now. What? Why? Explain the Great Leap Forward. Explain why we are so... Oh, okay. So the question that most people ask is, mm -hmm. if we came from monkeys, why are monkeys still around? Yeah. First answer, if you came from your parents, why are your parents still around? Uh, yeah. Okay. So... Okay. That's, that's part one. They don't have to <laughs> yeah, go away. Yeah, number no two, number two, we didn't come from monkeys. About... Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's take it back to the dinosaurs. Um, dinosaurs died out. There were three types of critters on land, animals. There were dinosaurs. There were reptiles who have their legs out to the side, not under their hips mm -hmm. like uh, mammals do, and dinosaurs. The dinosaurs, almost all of them died out except for the birds. Birds mm -hmm. are dinosaurs. They, uh, they're still here around. Today, you have a chicken egg, you're having a dinosaur egg. Mm -hmm. So the humans, the mammals, we then sort of kept on evolving. And around 55 million years ago, there was a little primate about the size of a rabbit, maybe quite small, but on two legs. That then kept on evolving and things really took off when we got a bit of data about maybe 20 million years ago in Africa. And by the time we get to 7 million years ago in Africa, that's when we split off from the chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. Now, a little detour here. You might have heard recently that some astronaut went into space and when he came back, his DNA was 7% different from his brother's DNA, identical twin who'd stayed yeah. on Earth. Scott Kelly, I think. Yeah, they lied. Name. Okay. Mate, 7% different? You're different. Your DNA is 2% different from a DNA. If <laughs> yeah. he was 7% different, he would be flying yeah. like He'd a dragon. He'd be a dinosaur. He'd be something. He'd be, a dinosaur. He'd be radically different. <laughs> yeah. The media got it wrong on that one. But yeah, so right. then, so chimpanzees are remarkably close to us, and we had a small brain back then. So we all share the primates. We all share the spine, which has got the spinal cord, mm -hmm. and then we've got the brain stem, which is involved in reactions and keeping your heart beating and your lungs going, and the um, cerebellum, which is for coordination, and the areas at the back of the skull, which turn electrical information from the retina into light. Mm -hmm. And they're pretty big areas. They're, if you imagine the clenched fists of a baby, imagine two of them, one on each side, and then there's, they had other bits of area of brain to do with motor, but they didn't have the frontal area. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, with those chimpanzees, their brain, their forehead sort of went sort of back at a steep angle. Mm -hmm. and they didn't have any frontal brain, whereas our forehead goes virtually straight up. And so we've got an extra part of the brain uh, compared to them that's evolved that way over the last seven million years to help us do the finer things of life like poetry, income tax, Weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> well, we don't really, we don't really like to use it for income tax, but uh, we, we we outsource that part. We've got we've got tax tax accountants for uh, with rather strange shaped heads for the for the tax part, right? Okay, so um, and then the brain gradually got bigger and bigger, and there were many branchings along the way, many many, and overwhelmingly. Uh, they died out and we interbred with them mm -hmm. along the way. And so for a long time, we thought that there were these Neanderthal people who were pretty different from us. They left Africa long before we did. And then recently we discovered that we have everybody who was not from Africa has Neanderthal in their DNA. Yeah. A couple of percent. Up to 7%, I think, up to in Europe, isn't it? Don't know the exact number, but it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's more than one and less than 10. It's, it's somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. And then um, recently we made, an, and the reason it's not in Africans, is that they, the humanoids that stayed in Africa, well, they didn't breed with the Neanderthals because they weren't in Africa. So, And mm -hmm. then we discovered in a cave in Denisova, in some part of Russia, 
a finger. And we looked at the DNA, and it was a kid, and it's another human that was around till about, I don't know, 40,000 years ago. So it wasn't Homo sapiens sapiens, it was Homo denisovans or something. Mm -hmm. And people in China and some of us have got uh, Denisovan DNA in us. Mm -hmm. So we also, so we've bred with these other humanoid creatures along the way. And around, well, we used to think it was around 200,000 years ago, there was just us. And then about 70,000 years ago, we left Africa uh, during an ice age when the ice was one kilometre thick over New York and Germany and the ocean levels were about 100, 120 metres lower and we pretty well walked our way out of Africa around the world with a bit of island hopping and end up at one extreme in Australia then did a bit of ocean hopping and end up in uh, Polynesia as well. Mm -hmm. So what happened to these other Homo um, Denisovan, Homo um, Neanderthals, these guys? So... We did we war with these other homo, um, other parts of the family tree. Why are they not around anymore? Why, what happened there? We don't know. We don't, uh, know. We don't have enough information. We don't mm -hmm. have, firstly, a written record, and we mm -hmm. don't have an oral tradition uh, telling us of how they died. So, with regard to oral tradition, people used to think, and wrongly, that oral tradition was not very accurate. But now, uh, looking closely at the Aboriginal oral tradition, we find it can be surprisingly accurate for 1,000, 5,000, 15,000 years back. Right. And what we've used as markers is the rising of the oceans after the last ice age finished about 18,000 years ago. And we know we've got a pretty accurate timeline for that. And then the we have different legends from around the country where the Aborigines have described how... Um, Rottnest Island got separated from the mainland, how Spencer Gulf got flooded, how there was a great flood coming into Fort Port Phillip Bay, how an island off the coast of Cairns ended up getting separated from the mainland. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we do not have, we have oral traditions with the Aborigines, but we do not have oral traditions going back to the Denisovans or yeah. the Neanderthals. It just wasn't kept, it didn't survive. Um, yeah, fair enough. That's a really um, interesting um Interesting tidbit there. Do you uh, can you talk to us about the the Noah's Ark, the the flood myths that have been circulating around? Because all different uh, all different societies and cultures throughout time have their version of that flood myth from around the same time. Do you buy into any of the um, the there's a there's a, a theory of the North American ice shelf being hit by an asteroid and that being the Great Flood. Because mm -hmm. in one in a split second, it was effectively all this huge sheet of ice was melted, and that became the great flood that happened around the world. Do you know? Uh, can you talk to us about these these myths of Noah's Ark all around the world, and if they if there was any chance that it, they're more than myths? Well, they're not all around the world. They're not uh, that case here in Australia. Mm -hmm. But uh, with many of the people around the Middle East, around the Mediterranean, they were there, mm -hmm. and so the Mediterranean had one big flood about 300,000 years ago when during an ice age and then it had several other floods the most recent flood was i think about 8,000 years ago and that happened in different stages gotcha. so there was the flooding of the uh let me look on my head the western mediterranean which is sort of from the atlantic ocean to say the bottom of italy and then there was another flooding from the bottom of italy across to greece turkey and then another flooding of the black sea Mm -hmm. So, with regard to the one of the uh, from west, um, take two. With regard to the flooding of the western Mediterranean into the dry land of the eastern Mediterranean, there was a waterfall that was effectively one and a half kilometres high, <laughs> and it created a sediment plain five kilometres long. Wow. And it ran for, I don't know how long. And so um, that would have been a pretty dramatic thing for people mm -hmm. to talk about and incorporate into their religion. But 300,000 years ago, that's way too long. Mm -hmm. So the uh, flood myths that we have today almost certainly relate to the flooding of the Black Sea. So you head your way in the Mediterranean, you go past Spain, past Italy, past Greece and Turkey, then up through that narrow straits where um, 
we have the Anzac Day thing happening and then you're into the Black Sea. And it was that flooding. And I forget the date, I think it was 4,000 or 6,000 years ago that um, we think has made its way into the Middle Eastern religions and then they've spread out, out across the world. But not so in China. They've got different uh, legends. Okay, very, very cool. Um, look, Carl, I've got a few uh, topics that I want to definitely touch on while we've got you here. Sure. A few of the things that are um, probably top of mind science around the world at the moment. And yeah. one of them that fascinates me the most is, so we've talked a little bit just now about our past and where we've come from and, mm-hmm. and how we got to where we are now. Um, and obviously, on the opposite end of the scale, we have our future. Um, one of the most interesting things that's, uh, that's, that's coming down the pike, uh, I suppose, is artificial intelligence. Mm-hmm. Moore's Law, will we get there? What will happen? Will it be um, Terminator 2 Skynet scenario or will it be the world is, all the problems in the world are fixed, everybody's living on a um, universal basic income and happy days into the future. What are your thoughts on artificial intelligence? Firstly, will we get there? And secondly, what will the ramifications be? Good, bad, who knows? Uh, will we get to artificial intelligence? Yes. What are the ramifications? The first one's going to be massive unemployment. Mm-hmm. So the big kick through was by Underwood in 2012 when some of his mates were trying to do a PhD on faces and they were trying to get computer programs to make faces and they just couldn't do it. You know, sometimes they'd leave out near and at the best they didn't look very well and he, he, he went back that night and he, he, they were having a big drink to celebrate their PhD and he started thinking about it and then suddenly he came up with the idea of getting two artificial program, artificial intelligence programs to fight each other. Mm-hmm. This is the big thing right now. G-A-N. G for generative. They're generating stuff. A, adversarial. They're fighting each other. N for networks. G-A-N. Remember that phrase. Mm-hmm. And so you've got these generative adversarial networks that are fighting each other and one of them is trying to make faces and the other one is saying is a discriminator. It says, no, that's crap. And eventually, they run through so many iterations, they get to the stage where they now make faces that are indistinguishable from human faces. And so we've already got there in the game of Go. Do you remember about the artificial intelligence with the game of Go? No, I'm not sure, no. Okay, so what happened was that we've got this game called Go, which is deceptively simple. All you've got to do is surround your opponent's little pebbles and you've got white and black ones and that's it. And there's a whole bunch of moves that we've generated from this Asian game over the last uh, few thousand years. And in AlphaGo, the first version, um, they just taught it everything we'd ever done. Mm -hmm. And um, it was pretty good. Uh, It took a long time. Uh, and it, I think it beat a human using the knowledge of every single game that every, every human had ever played. Mm-hmm. AlphaGo Zero had zero knowledge of any games that humans had played. AlphaGo Zero was actually two artificial intelligences that played games with each other, and the entire game, instead of taking hours, would take a millionth of a second, mm-hmm. and they do it again and again for months. Mm. And suddenly... They, they got this thing trained up so it was really good. Uh, and they said, thank you, <laughs> adversarial half of the network, you're off. You're, and then got to play against the human and it came out with some moves that nobody had ever seen before. Mm-hmm. So on one hand, artificial intelligence is coming and GAN, the Generative Adversarial Networks, is a big part of it. And one of the early results is going to be massive unemployment and... One thing, what was the thing you used for the wage that everybody gets paid? The Universal basic income. UBI, UBI. UBI. Yeah. One advantage of that is that there's enough money to go around for everybody. Yeah. Uh, if it wasn't being sucked up. So what we've got is not a trickle-down economy, but a suck-up com- economy where the money is being sucked from the poor to the wealthy. And it's just kind of embarrassing when you read some of these magazines that are aimed specifically at what are called HNWIs or high net worth individuals, pretty well every every advertisement is for something really expensive. You yeah. expect that. But about every fifth one is for watches. Why do you need a $50,000 watch or a $100,000 watch? Is that the best 
thing we can do from the point of society and helping each other to wear a year's wages on your wrist? Well, well, society's ridiculous. Let's let's True. be honest. Oh, no, let's, but it's, going, uh, it's getting better. It's getting better. But I mean, when you look around today, I'm walking through Sydney, and every every second that I I glance around the streets, I'm just looking at advertising. Buy this, buy that. This is all useless. Most most useless things. This, this is what this podcast is. You, we are advertising your travel network. We should advertise we my book, which is my last one, which is Carl the Universe and Everything. <laughs> yeah. A very modest title, but you're right. So we all. But doing we are advertising. also having an interesting conversation. Yeah, like I, I really enjoy these these yeah, this conversations. It's called a honeypot. Okay. Yeah. So you're putting out the honeypot so the people get suckered into doing the. Uh, yeah, yeah, but it's value as well. Like it's more. It's this is more than a billboard, surely. It's this a is, long billboard. Is, it's a long, yeah, slow billboard. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. Um, right. So you're walking around Sydney, you're seeing all this crappy advertising everywhere. Yep. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, um, getting back to universal basic income, um, I mean, sh- surely there's... When the the robots take over our, our jobs, which is everybody's thinking that's what's going to happen, obviously. The, the, yeah, okay. The, so a bit of a diversion here. Uh, in China... Artificial intelligence is behind the American versions, except in the last year, they're now winning three out of every four competitions, so they're about to overtake. Mm-hmm. The result is going to be that in driverless cars will be in China in 10 years, in the West in 20 years. Okay, back to this, your main thought of... Um, yeah, well, my, my thought on universal basic income is um, surely if... I mean, everything's being roboticized. I mean, the 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 truck driver, Uber driver. This this is the biggest shakeup that's going to come. There's going to be no drivers, and there's such a huge economy in in the states and all around the world that is people that are driving jobs. Mm-hmm. So if you take those out, surely there's still going to be the same amount of money in the economy. It's just going to be less hours worked per person, right? Every time we have a big revolution like the internet and agriculture and the car, like there's new jobs that are created, and if there isn't, surely the same amount of money in the economy, less hours worked, surely universal basic income, like we can get it right, can't we? Um, I remember reading science fiction stories way back then and uh, the problem was with uh, so many robots doing our jobs and everybody being so wealthy that we'd all have to go to university to study how to use up our spare time and do courses in sculpture and art mm-hmm. and everything because we'd have so much spare time. Mm-hmm. Did it happen? No. But this time I think it might happen and we... I don't think there will be the same sorts of jobs coming, but there's something about a job that makes you feel useful in society as opposed to just sort of drifting around. Like having a function, having a usefulness yeah. is, is part of the human psyche. But we're, well, think of what we are. We're a an animal with very weak claws, very weak teeth, um, not able to run very fast, but we've become top dog on a planet because of our big brain. Mm-hmm. And along the way, we evolved the tribe, and our society is changing. What we're finding now is that the 1% of the population who are the psychopaths in tendency, they're rising to the top. What happens with psychopaths, and I'm sure you've, once you get old enough, you realise when somebody screwed you over, you think, why'd they do that? And you suddenly realise... It didn't matter if it was me or somebody else. They would have done to whoever was in that position. Yeah, yeah. It's like the scorpion and the frog. It's in their nature. Yeah, yeah. So where these psychopathic people end up is often due to a two-by-two two grid of intelligence versus violence. And if they're intelligent and not violent, they'll end up becoming a politician or a big company leader. <laughs> and so they'll end up driving more money towards themselves. So we need mm. a sense of social justice in the society. And things are changing rapidly. It's very hard to predict. Like, so for example, journalism, especially investigative journalism, journalism was driven by selling houses and knickknacks. Now it's being driven by clicks um, Mm -hmm. on the internet. And Facebook is a large part of journalism. 60% of millennials today get their news not from radio, TV, or newspapers, mm. but from the sidebar that scrolls past on their yeah. web social application. Which is a huge problem in itself. I mean, then you just get in the... Um, it's the same as YouTube. You, you start with one idea in mind and you get 50 of the next uh, videos that'll autoplay, that'll be reinforcing that uh, that that thought process of yours. But um, back to your point about universal basic income and, and having something to work for and feeling you know like you have a purpose in life and so forth mm-hmm. I totally agree I think that is uh, really rewarding and a, and a great part of life but at the moment so the average person around the world surely works 40 hours let's say so for me 
if universal basic income was uh, to come along, we're all going to be paid a little allowance per week. No, no, allowance enough that you can buy a new pair of shoes when you need to and yep. also can afford to buy a house and go on holidays and have a car. Yeah. There's enough money in the system for all of that. Not a little yeah. allowance, but a, a real, proper, universal, yeah. basic income, yeah? Yeah. So, for example, if uh, robots take most of our half of our jobs, let's say half yeah. of our jobs, so surely we could set up a system where we would work half the time. So if you gave me... 20 extra hours in my week if I was able to do what I do which I'm very passionate about for 20 hours a week I'd be over the moon then I would go and study Spanish more go and learn the guitar go and do a go back to study and do something that really interests me mm. surely there's like you know surely that's the best case scenario would you would you agree are you going to go into politics to make it happen am I yes no, I'm going to cross right. my fingers and hope, case, hope to God that our politicians do what they should, which they probably won't. Because they're psychopaths. Yeah. <laughs> because they've risen into that position of power because they Damn have it. psychopathic tendencies. Damn it. You have to run Why? for politics. I ran for politics in 2007. I could run. I could, be your co- I could be your co. I could be your. Uh, I could be your ideas, man. You need. You've got to have. Okay, Chairman Mao said, you mm-hmm. know, from China, mm-hmm. politics. No, he didn't. He said power grows out of the barrel of a gun. Mm -hmm. But in Australia and many countries around the world, power grows out of politics. Mm -hmm. Either you get in there or you leave the people who are in there already there and many of them have psychopathic tendencies. Either you're going to keep on shouting at the TV or you're going to be on TV. Mm -hmm. But if you don't go into politics, bad people will. Mm -hmm. And part of it is that they've managed to convince us that politics is a bad and boring game that you don't want to get into because they're all crooked. Do you remember some years ago that John Howard spent a lot of time walking around in various pastel-coloured jumpsuits with sports teams on the, the back mm-hmm. of them? Mm-hmm. Do you know what else he did that year? No. He committed Australia to buying a bunch of dud submarines for pretty well three-quarters of our gross domestic product. Mm-hmm. Did you notice? No. No. Right. So if you didn't All I noticed notice- was, his, was, his, um, was his bowling arm in, right. uh, so, over in the subcontinent. So if you didn't notice, then you, by default, put him in power. Mm-hmm. All that you need for bad to triumph is that good people do nothing. Mm-hmm. If you do nothing, then bad things will happen. Mm-hmm. It's up to you to get involved in politics. And it's in the interest of the people who control the situation to keep us out. Mm. Your call. Think about it. Sleep on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll let you know tomorrow if I've, uh, if I've decided to jump in longer. there. Longer. It'll take longer. Oh, all right. No worries. Um, okay, here's my, um, here's my other question on artificial intelligence. So yeah. Moore's Law, obviously... Um, Moore's law is that computer programming's doubling every year, every two years, something along so those lines. So Gordon Moore, who set up Intel in uh-huh. the mid-1960s, came out with Moore's law, which says that the available computing power, processing power, or, he also said, the number of electronic components in a given volume doubles mm-hmm. every, and he picked a number 15, 18, 20 months. And we've been going down Moore's law from the mid-1960s to the mid 2010s, and now we're beginning to run close to the maximum packing density, no heat dissipation. Gotcha. And so now we're heading down a different pathway, which is parallel processing, and the next follow-on from that will be quantum computers. Mm -hmm. So uh, quantum computing is big. Surprisingly, Microsoft, which sort of copied Apple, which copied Xerox with regard to the Windows thing and went down a certain pathway. Now Microsoft is investing hundreds of millions and tens of billions of dollars a year in artificial intelligence on short and long-term payoffs. And so they're going to become one of the major players. And I think, uh, sorry, in, in quantum mechanics. And so quantum mechanics quantum computers they're going to be coming almost certainly Mm -hmm. and uh, Microsoft will be one of the big players but other people will get there as well there'll be upsets along the way but they think about it so much they're putting in tens of billions of dollars into it Mm -hmm. and and this is not just over one week this is over years over decades Mm -hmm. so that's how we'll get our future increases in quantum power I would like to have in my brain implanted number one a uh, little memory chip about the size of a head of a match with all of Encyclopedia Britannica and Wikipedia and all of my books and all of the internet right now. And then secondly, I'd like to have a little tiny quantum computer also the size of a head of a match implanted in my brain. Um, 
And that's definitely definitely uh, where we'll be heading, I think. Don't so know. At the moment, the best we've got that if you want to know what two numbers multiply together mm-hmm. to give you 15, with a high degree of assurance, a quantum computer can tell you it's probably five and three. Mm-hmm. That's where we are now. Mm-hmm. Where we're heading is much better than that. And they will be the next big jump if we can make them work, and we probably will. Okay, so um, what about all the doomsday uh, doomsayers of obviously artificial intelligence. So once we get to artificial intelligence computers being as powerful as we are, if we can have quantum computing and we can still go down the path of Moore's Law where we're, we're doubling and tripling and obviously year after year after year, what happens in 20 years' time when computing power is so infinitesimally, I don't know the word, sorry, um, so infinitely, sorry, uh, more powerful than us, mm. What happens to us with science and technology and um, creating things? Do we do we stop creating? Is it just have we created effectively gods and we're just uh, the lower form of intelligence on the planet? Like what what are the mm. what are your thoughts there? And also, I know that was a big question, and you could talk for probably half an hour oh, on I that one. Got a question already? <laughs> yeah, sorry. All right. And so what was the question again? Uh, what are your thoughts on when we create? something that's so much more powerful and smarter than us, it takes us out of the whole process of science creation. Okay. Have you uh, heard the um, saying, fire is a good servant but a bad master? hmm So what do you think that means uh, in terms mean, of fire? Yeah, it means that you want to always control the fire or you're going to get burnt. Yeah. And the same applies to artificial intelligence and drones. I've been mm-hmm. following drones, originally called unmanned, pilotless vehicles then uh, goes through a whole bunch of different names till nowadays we call them drones I've been following them for about a third of a century and originally they were saying wow these are amazing technologies wouldn't it be good if we could um, uh, have bigger and better cameras and then they went to the well wouldn't it be good if we had weapons on them that we could fire at the enemy uh, but only under our control and now Mm -hmm. we've got drones that fire weapons under their own decision making. Mm. I think we've lost the bit of fire is a good servant but a bad master. And so what they've got to do is get into the situation where we are controlling the artificial intelligence so you don't allow it total control. Mm-hmm. You keep it as a servant. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, we've not done that with regard to drones. So Mm -hmm. there are, in certain circumstances, drones that will go into a foreign country and then, under their own decision-making, fire off weapons Mm. and kill people. I think at that stage, we've gone down a bad pathway. Mm. Um, So if we get to the point where um, computers are so much more powerful than us, how do we... How do we make sure that they they work for us? And because effectively, we don't know how consciousness came to be. We don't even know what consciousness is. Where it's stored in a brain. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So, so if consciousness is maybe computing power, the brain's able to obviously uh, how much output it can put forward. Then, how are we to know that once we get to to the point where a computer is 100 times more powerful than us, which once we hit that artificial intelligence won't take too long if Moore's law is um, still, you know, in play. Or the parallel processing in the quantum computers. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's so, the next step. Yep. So so how do we know that... Um, how do we know or, or what leads us to believe that computers aren't going to gain their own consciousness and then just wipe us We've from got the to have some degree of philosophy. Like in mm-hmm. our society, we need the garbage men and the scientists and the fire officers and name every trade, chippies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we need the musicians and the Mm -hmm. painters and the sculptors and the poets and the philosophers to act as our moral compass and tell us that things have gone too far in the wrong direction or to say this is a good direction. We need those people and we need to listen to them and encourage them. We've struggled through manfully. We've ended up in a situation where the world is a much better place than it was 50 years ago, 100 years ago. Mm-hmm. And providing the we don't allow too many psychopaths to get into politics, providing we keep ordinary people like you and me going into politics, even though it takes your whole life because you're doing it for the good of the community, 
I think we'll end up in a good place. I'm getting attracted to what I believe was the ancient Greek idea that you just pick at random a bunch of people and make them politicians, mm-hmm. and if they stuff up, you kill them at the end of that time. <laughs> yeah, just like a jury, just like jury duty, kind of. Well, you don't let them to have too much power, and it's a fixed term of duty. Mm-hmm. And I think there's an advantage in just having the average citizen off the street, because what we've got at the moment the people with psychopathic tendencies able to manipulate the situation so they get to be the ones mm-hmm. making the decisions. Mm-hmm. So is what you're saying, you don't really believe that humans basically... Because I think the big problem with humanity is we have too much greed. Obviously, that's one of the big problems that where we can have such huge disparities. But you think that it's really the, the 1% that are getting into power and that humans, by and large, aren't as greedy and as, as um, narrow-minded and as able to turn the blind eye to all these things that we do you think that there's really there is good in people and there is there is hope rather than not i spent some years of my life working as a medical doctor and you really get into people's lives you take a medical history and then you find out about their family history their psychological history their medical history their gynecological history and you get into their relationships and their sex lives and everything and People are overwhelmingly either good or just misinformed, but still good. Mm -hmm. And so they wrongly think that if you have, for example, immigration into a country, that it will lead to poverty in the country, whereas 19 times out of 20, it leads to the country getting better. They've just Mm -hmm. been misinformed, Mm -hmm. and it's not their fault. And only a very, very tiny percentage of people, 1% or so, are the people who need to be kept in line by the laws of our society. Mm -hmm. And um, if you have just laws and you concentrate on rehabilitation, the psychopathic people can get by just fine and the rest of us get by fine and we end up in a better place. Mm -hmm. But it's up to all of us to get involved. And internally, a little tiny bit of me weeps when somebody says, I don't care about politics, they're all crooked, I'm not going to vote. At that stage, you've done nothing and evil can begin to triumph just a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, Carl, I've got to be uh, got to be conscious of your time today. Um, do you mind if we swing to a few questions Anything. that we normally close Lame. the show with? Lame on me. Alrighty, so not too science based, but uh, Tommy is my co-host. He's not with us today, so I'll actually do his three questions as well. Um, so rather rapid fire. My first question, Carl, is your favourite travel destination on the planet and why? Uh, number one, somewhere I've never been. Mm-hmm. Uh, why? Because I love to learn new things. Mm-hmm. Okay, next question. Well, you just took my next question from me because my next question was going to be your dream destination, top of your bucket list, somewhere that you haven't been. Um, uh, everywhere in the world I want to go. <laughs> yeah, that's um, good. Give it, you've got to give me one though, Carl. You've got to give me something here. Um, well, I'm heading off to Tibet and Mongolia this year and mm-hmm. then I'm going to Antarctica again at the end of next year. I've spent uh, two years total travelling through the Australian outback and our, on our biggest journey, we um, didn't see anybody for a month. So we left Alice Springs, went west for a 1,000 kilometres, turned right, went north for a 1,000 kilometres. We saw another group of travellers for a few hours, and mm-hmm. that was it in the wow. whole month. Wow. And we are on our own, carrying all of our own food mm-hmm. and all of our own fuel for a whole month. And that was just a gorgeous trip. Now, I've been through 15 of the 17 deserts in Australia. Mm -hmm. I'd really like to go through the Moon Desert in South Australia and the Great Victoria Desert in Western Australia. I love deserts in Australia. And I've taught all of the kids how to drive in sand, except for my uh, youngest daughter. And so I've got to teach her how to drive in sand. Cool. Uh, That's a great great answer. Um, My third and final question um, before I throw to the imaginary Tommy... uh, is uh, any book that you like to recommend to people uh, can be a biography, can be a graphic novel, can be any sort of book that you just like to... Uh... Factfulness. Oh, well, firstly, any of my books. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> uh, there's 43 of them. But <laughs> Factfulness, two books. Factfulness, all one word, by mm-hmm. Throsling, T-H-R-O-S-L-I-N-G. And, not all, but and, Econobabble, E-C-O-N-O, Babble, B A B B L E, by Richard Dennis, D N N I S. And both of those are skinny little books with big writing. You can read each one in an afternoon and they'll blow your mind. Econo Babble points out that hardly any politicians are economists. And when they start talking economics, 
99 times out of 100, they are talking total crap. Mm. And the economists in the audience say, what you just said contradicts what you said in the earlier part of your talk. It's just crap. Mm-hmm. And the rest of us go along with it. Yeah, we'll have more jobs and growth and, and thoughts and prayers. Thank you very much. Yeah. I love you. Yeah. Okay, so those two books. Read those two books. First one tells you how good the world is. Number two, uh, by Richard Dennis, tells you about the real situation with economics in politics. And yes, everybody in the audience, go into politics because if you don't, bad people will. Yeah. Or already are. Okay, I'll, next I'll question. I like it. And uh, so what do you like to do in your spare time, Carl? Um, family, uh, mm-hmm. friends, and travel, mm-hmm. um, and learn. Uh, so I love reading my way through the ten thousand dollars worth of scientific literature every year, and I keep on finding new and surprising things. Just the other day, I was reading that bad news, fake news, travels six times faster than good news, and it's pushed by humans, and it's pushed by our evolutionary history. And we have to give it up in the same way we have to give up eating too much. Mm-hmm. How's that for a complicated thought? <laughs> so with regard to eating too much, what we have for most of our history is not enough food. And only recently we've had enough food. And so we've got to learn not to eat just because we feel like it, but only when we're hungry. Mm-hmm. And we've got to learn, relearn to deal with a world where food is no more than one minute away. Maybe mm-hmm. 10 minutes absolute max if you're not in your own house near a refrigerator, right? Mm-hmm. So we have to learn how to deal with food and also... We have to learn how to deal with incoming information. Mm -hmm. In the old days, it was absolutely essential for our survival that if there was a strange bit of news or something you didn't understand, you would pay a lot of attention. And so if you're walking around and suddenly there's a rustling in the grass or a tree branch moves suddenly, you paid a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, you could die. Yeah, yeah. Nowadays, the world is different. But we've still got that reflex. So it suddenly comes through that the Earth is going to be wiped out by the moon running into Mars and collapsing us. We'll read that, whereas actually it's just an advertisement for something crappy. So we've got to learn to put ourselves on a drip filter of bad news because there isn't that much bad news. And if there is, you can wait. And if you keep on taking in all the bad news all the time, your brain doesn't get a chance to see the reality around you. And you live in a fake reality where you stumble from pseudo-climax to pseudo-disaster over and over again, and you don't see the world for what it is, and you're living in yeah. a dream bubble. Yeah. Um, clickbait. Um, okay, Carl, so my next question. Uh, you're, you've got a dinner party, uh, three people, dead or alive, you can bring them. Uh, who would they be and why? Oh, that's easy. Um, uh, Jesus Christ, the Buddha, and Muhammad. Mm-hmm. Cool. I like I'd it. just like to see why they did what they did and um, how they thought what they thought. It would be fascinating. Mm-hmm. Very good. Um, and the final question, uh, who did you look up to as a child or somebody that you look up to now? Who's been a, a somewhat of a role model in your life to this point? Oh, millions of people. So many people. Anybody who has a skill. So if I see a tradie and they're doing a really good job, Man, I'm their best friend. Mm-hmm. And so if I'm watching a tradie who just stops then and says it's morning tea time and makes their own cup of coffee, and when they do their work, they do it beautifully, mate, I'm their biggest fan. Yeah. Anybody who does anything excellently, if I was a garbo, I'd be the best garbo you ever saw. Mm-hmm. And so I try to do everything I can to the best of my ability, bearing in mind I'm trying to do too many things. <laughs> so basically anybody in any field of human endeavour who does it well. Mind you, I've got to like it. So I'm a bit more into heavy metal than I am into hip hop. But I do admire the skill in both of them. <laughs> yeah, okay. No, good answer. Um, so, Carl, that's basically uh, it for me. Where can people find you, mate? Anything you want to plug before we uh, before we wrap it up here? Uh, well, I've got a lot of stuff for free on my homepage, drcarl.com. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, yeah, plug. I'll give away free science question and answer sessions with schools around the world. Just yesterday morning, I did one with Canada. Wow. I'm doing one, but I do two every week in Australia. So just go to drcarl.com, D R K A R L.com. Happy to do a three quarter hour free science QA session with your school. And there's lots of free content on drcarl.com, which the students can cut and paste and use as their own homework because the teachers haven't yeah. heard of the internet yet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Solid advice. All right, well, uh, Carl, thanks so much for coming on the show. And uh, from us, that's a wrap. Thank you very much. All right, guys, if you enjoyed that show, please subscribe on either uh, your listening device or on YouTube. You can head to www.youtube.com forward slash adventurefit. 
just uh, travel. Um, also, guys, uh, the show notes can be found at www.adventurefittravel.com forward slash radio. Also, don't forget to support the show via our sponsors, which are trueprotein.com.au. Um, use the code ADVF for 10% off there. And also, guys, support us on Patreon. Head to patreon.com forward slash AD. Oh. Head to patreon.com forward slash AdventureFit for uh, the ability to support us there and help us keep this thing growing into the future. That's it from me. See you next week. Discovery Roger, go for deploy.